You're listening to the West Side Podcast, a part of the LA International Church of Christ family of churches, worshiping God in LA since 1989. Great. Uh, there's a little bit more of you than I imagined there would be. It's more than just me in the mirror, you know? <laughs> uh, oh, let me put this here on the, on the side. Uh, good morning, church. Uh, My name is Albert Roldan, as you may have heard before. Uh, I've been a member of the Westside Church for a couple years now, about four years. Uh, I actually am currently at ASU studying psychology online. I'm still here in California, I promise. Uh, And I also help co-lead our team ministry here in uh, the Westside. Absolutely love those guys. And guys, there's no teen service today because I'm up here. So... uh, Oh, and yes, uh, I do sometimes, if you're thinking, oh, he kind of looks familiar. Yes, I do play for our bass. Uh, I play for the worship team. I'm up here in that little corner, which is super cool. Uh, They say I'm there for the bass, but I think they really just want me there because the hair and the way it flops around when I dance. Um, Right? Uh, Now, some of you may know, recently we've been going through our series by faith. Uh, And so this is about uh, Hebrews 11, which is more commonly known as the Hall of Faith. Uh, It's about all these biblical characters that are written about and their generous acts of faith, those those things that we think about and we tell our kids uh, as time goes on, right? Um, So this is something that has been done before, and it's something that will be done again, but that doesn't make it any less impactful, right? doesn't matter if it's been your first time or your 20th time. uh, There's still something that we can get from this. Uh, See, the, the thing is, is I'm 21 years old, and believe it or not, I don't have all the answers. I wish I did, and that would make my life a lot easier. Uh, I'm sure there are people in this room right now who have read the Bible fully more times than years I've been alive. Uh, So I don't mean to date anybody, but still. Uh, So we're going to let the scriptures speak for themselves today, right? Amen? Amen. All right. So now the character that I'm going to go over today is Noah. Uh, Hopefully this works. Y'all see that? It works. Uh, Sorry. Uh, So (laughs) I have Noah today, uh, and it's quite a recognizable name uh, and a good story to read up on. So that's what we're going to do, right? So let's just hop into it really quick. Let's open up to Hebrews 11.7. And so in it, it says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Okay, so there are two clearly section parts here. There's two different sentences that are talked about about Noah. So let's go through each of them first, right? Uh, so the first point that we see here is, is by faith, when warned about things not yet seen, and holy fear built an ark to save his family, and I don't have a connector, so we're just going to hop into the first point. Crazy faith. Okay, all right, okay, so that, that doesn't sound like something in favor for Noah, right? You never want to be known as the crazy guy. Um, but let's read his story before we make any judgments about Noah, okay? So, it might be a little small for y'all, uh, but I'll read it out to us. In Genesis 6, 9 through 22, it says, This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. I saw the translation, it was really hard to pronounce. Uh, But God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I surely am going to destroy them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Uh, Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. 
Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Okay, so what do we see here? We see a man who was given instructions for building an ark to save humanity, or what would be known as the ark, what would become known as that. You know, in the biblical canon, we see two really important arcs, the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark. That's really important to be considered as highly and equally valued as the Ark of the Covenant, right? So that's pretty cool. Uh, But the ark is essentially a giant boat or a barge. That's probably a closer depiction to what it would have looked like. Uh, But don't just take my word for it. The super cool people over at the Creation Museum in Kentucky recreated the ship. And so this is what it looks like. And if you can see, if you can squint really hard, at the very bottom right, there's a person next to it. That's to scale. That's how large this boat is. And as you can see, it was a large, flat boat meant to be little more than a raft for rivers. And that would have been fine for the time. Uh, Noah's story supposedly takes place in Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, and it was known for its hot and dry weather uh, and its climate there. But it was also known for its yearly flood cycles. Uh, So they did have access to rivers. There was a river system, and they all flushed out to the sea. So it made sense that they would have some form of uh, water transportation, mainly for... uh, commerce, transportation, convenience, right? So that makes sense. So building a boat wasn't necessarily out of the question. But a boat that was 440 feet long? No. Sorry, okay. So those cubits that I was talking about, right? Uh, It says 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. It roughly translates to 440 feet long. 72 feet wide and 43 feet high. Noah built something that at the time was not only of ridiculous proportion, but inefficient. And some would even say a waste of materials, right? Like if uh, I built an Olympic-sized pool, and some of you are like, whoa, an Olympic-sized pool, but let me tell you, it's outside and in the Arctic. (laughs) That wouldn't make much sense. I'd nudge the person next to me and be like, hey, man, you want to go swimming? They're like, no, it's an ice block, bro. It's negative 12 degrees. I don't want to go swimming. I want hot cocoa in my little igloo. That's what they're like. It doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, But then we get to more logical questions, not just like ridiculous examples. We get to more logical questions. Where could have all that precious lumber gone? They're in the desert. That's not a readily available resource. What about the nailing? The pitch, that's tar that's used to keep it all together. That's valuable resources. What about the manpower? People must have looked at Noah's Ark and, because it wasn't finished in a day and thought, man, what a waste. Right? And I'm sorry to mislead you. The first point isn't that Noah was crazy or that crazy faith. It's actually Noah's crazy faith. And it's not crazy as in like, whoa, that's crazy. You put a lemon in your carbonated water. It's crazy like, why would you do that? Why would you push your car off the side of a ledge? That's insane. You need that to get home. I can't imagine that Noah came home to his wife and was like, honey, guess what I got you today? And she's like, a new car? And he's like, nope, a thousand pounds of lumber. And she looks over at him and she's she's not going to jump for joy. She's going to look at him. She's going to say, why would you do that? Why? (laughs) She's going to look at him and say, what about our children? What about our children's children, their future, their college tuitions? They didn't have that at the time, but go with it. (laughs) Right? These are legitimate concerns that every one of us would have when we think about something so life-changing. But not for Noah. Because he knew that God would provide for him because God doesn't do things lightly. Noah was willing to bet it all on God. So then the question becomes, are we? Are you? Am I? I don't know. Maybe that's why he's in the hall of faith and I'm not. But that's the reason why he's in the hall of faith, right? He, he did it. He's an example of how we can live to show us that we need to bet it all on God and not hedge those bets because those bets are important. Come on, right? Imagine 
if Noah saw God's instructions, he was like, 440 feet? No. You know, let, let's go 300. That's a, little, that's a little bit more in the budget. And then the floodwaters came and all the animals started coming up and the elephants got there. And he's like, sorry, dog, I'm out of space. Good luck. I hope you can swim. We wouldn't have elephants. How, how crazy is that, right? God would have had to adjust his plans to Noah's preference. And man, who does that sound like? Us. I know for me, I can't even tell you how many times I've said, well, like, if I kind of do this, like, I'll still be okay with God, right? Uh, taking shortcuts to get to where my preferences are, where they lie, not where God's plan demands me to be. I forgot that my preference does not go above his providence. Noah didn't. Noah pushed his plans to the side because he knew that God's plans were higher than his own. And that's the crux of it. Noah's faith was crazy, not because of what he did, but because of how much he committed to it. How hard he clung to God's promises and the hope that God knew better than he did. So take a step back and ask yourself, when was the last time that I really went out on the limb for God? Oh, sure, it's cool to read about, but what about doing it? You know, we could see Noah and be like, whoa, that guy's got some crazy faith. I could never have that faith. And then the temptation is, is after this, to think to yourself, wow, that was a great sermon, Albert. You're such a good speaker, and your hair is amazing. I know, what can I say? Just go with it. <laughs> but that's the thing is we keep wishing for an ark when the rains are already upon us. Noah's method is simple. Do it. There was no hesitation from what we read in his story. Noah didn't wait for the rains. And this isn't just exclusive to Noah. We see this throughout the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, people doing insane things. That's why they're in the hall of faith. And we see an example of this and how people react when faith is put into action. In Mark 14, three through four, and it says, while he was in Bethany, he being Jesus, if you didn't think I was gonna talk about Jesus, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> reclining at the table, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor and they rebuked her harshly. And you know what's crazy? I bet you there's some of us in this room right now that are thinking, yeah, that, hey, they kind of have a point. That's a year's worth of wages. I mean, I get the point, it was symbolic. She did it on purpose, but she could have used a cheaper perfume, right? That, that's, that's the temptation is to think that way. But faith and action is always under accusation. Yeah. Now, do you guys mind if I tell you a story? Come on now. Right? It's not a story of success, but what could have been a success. And I am sad to say that it's about me. Uh, but for context, three things. So for one, my parents can attest to this, I was not the greatest student in high school. I know teens, I'm supposed to be an example. Don't do as I've done. Uh, two, when I say high school, my high school was a junior, senior high school, which means it went from seventh grade to 12th grade. That'll be important later, I promise. And it all kind of blends together. So when I say high school, it's because I didn't like it. Uh, and lastly, I have a big family. And when I say cousin, I'm gonna be talking about four different things. There's a bunch of cousins that I have. Just roll with it. Yep, that's a couple of them over there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the thing was is I was not the best student in high school. My parents can attest to that. And so this one year, it's the end of my eighth grade going into the summer. I'm super excited. There's two weeks left. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just remembering this story. Uh, and I'd gotten a D in my English class. I know. I'm the worst. Uh, but I'm trying to, I'm, like, I'm feeling smug about it. Because me and one of my other cousins, Marquise, he's not here, uh, but uh, <laughs> he and me had come up with this plan for after this party, he was going to come home with us. And for the first month of summer, he was going to stay at our house. 
and we were so excited because we had so many plans, y'all. We were going to go outside. We were going to play Minecraft. Then we were going to nap. Then we were going to play more Minecraft. And then we were going to eat junk food. And, oh, that was it. Uh, <laughs> and so we had this plan, and we're super excited. So we go to this party. We're here. We're celebrating. And the entire time, Marquise is acting off. I don't notice it because we're playing Minecraft, like I said. And I'm just excited. So towards the end of the time, uh, the party, we're like, my mom is like, okay, it's time to go. And I'm like, all right, Marquise, let's go. And Marquise breaks. He starts crying. And he walks away. He walks out of the room. I'm like, what's, what's going on? And my parents are like, because of your low grades, we told Marquise that he couldn't come over to our house. He couldn't stay with us. And the floodgates just broke. I start crying. There's snot running down my mouth. I'm screaming excuses at my parents, all this stuff. It goes on for like 15 minutes. It's just crazy. I'm having a full meltdown because this was my plan. And my consequence, I shouldn't have action, consequences for my actions. I'm an adult. I'm 15 at the time. Right? So then one of my older cousins, Desmond, love the guy. He says, all right, clear the room. I need to just talk to me and Albert. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So Des is like, sit down on, on the bed. And they had this big old bed. And I'm like half its size. And I hop on. I'm on the bed. And I'm giving him excuse after excuse. You don't understand, Des. I did this. I talked to the, t- to the teacher. He just doesn't like me. I-, I tried. I really tried. And he just says at the end of every single one of them is, you could have. You're right. You, you could have but you didn't. And that was the crux of it, is I didn't. I definitely could have raised that grade. Not to flex, but I'm okay at writing sentences sometimes. <laughs> I definitely could have at least gotten a C. It would have avoided the entire thing, but I didn't because I was afraid. Right? And that can kind of be similar to, to how we think about faith, right? Is we make excuses because we see these Bible stories and we're like, whoa, dude, I can never do that because this is real life and that's a Bible story. But don't we see that this real life is a Bible story? You're writing new chapters and you're afraid because someone else is supposed to step up to be Noah. Not you, right? Not me, right? That's not it. So, If you could take anything from this, do that thing. That crazy act of faith. I know that each and every one of us in your subconscious have seen something. I mean, like, man, I could do something. And immediately dismissed it because you're like, ah, that that can't be me. I don't have the faith to do that. God, God wouldn't work through my life like that, right? But if you don't believe me and you don't believe Noah, there's a certain Jedi grandmaster who you could believe. Yoda himself. Do or do not, there is no try. But again, let's, let's look at Hebrews and what it has to say about, uh, about Noah. Amen? All right. So let's skip that first part. By faith, when Noah uh, warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And in part B, it says, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Okay, so that's pretty crazy, right? But pretty unique, right? Kind of stands out, if you will. Dang it, that wasn't it. Dang it. The point is, faith stands out. That's my second point. I thought I had a slide prepared. That's on me, (laughs) y'all. But I know for me, Whenever I, I read that part, I read it several times through in the, in the process of writing the sermon. And every time that I read that B part, my, my eyes always got locked on one word, condemn. It's, it's a pretty intense word, right? It's a pretty negative word. We tend to think of it in a negative connotation, but uh, like, like a really bad one. But as I was writing this, I was like, man, what, is, what does condemn actually mean? And a lot of people who are speaking don't like to put up the, the dictionary definition, but I wanted to because I'm weird like that. Uh, and it says, condemn, express complete disapproval of typically in public censure. Uh, or two, sentence to a particular punishment. Oh, goodness, especially death. Okay. That's not great for Noah. <laughs> Uh, it sounds more so like he's going around or maybe he was spouting out 
self-righteousness the entire time. You're going to die because of what God told me in the floodwaters. Right? But let's, let's look at what leads up to this, this condemning of the world. Right? Let's go back to Genesis and read a little bit about what God saw. Right? So it says, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures uh, that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. He was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Okay, so we see already that Noah was an anomaly, right? Right? blameless among the people of his time, we don't see from this at all that Noah was bringing down the hammer of self-righteousness on people. But everyone around him could see what he was, how he lived, why he lived the way he lived, amen? God used him and his family as an example of what people could be, what they should be, what faithful people could achieve. And so when I think of faithful, I think of somebody very close to me. Uh, Some of you may not know her. Most of you don't know her here. Uh, I've known her since birth, um, and that is my wonderful and amazing mama. Uh, She's actually here today. Uh, No, come on, y'all. Clap a little harder. She brought me into this world. Goodness. And she always told me that she could take me out of it, too, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Right? Right? But as some of you who know, this is not an invitation after this to go up to my mother and ask her about her story. If you want to, get to know her first. Bring her some chocolate. She loves that stuff. Then maybe she'll tell you her story. Don't overwhelm her. All right. So what I'm telling this is my mom has had medical issues. Uh, For the majority of her life, it's affected her physical life. It's affected her marriage life. It's affected her spiritual life. Um, But she's never stopped being faithful. Right, that's how my mom has always been. That's, that's been what it is. It's, oh, I'm feeling bad, but I need to pray. Oh, Albert, you're, you're feeling bad. But have you prayed yet? Ah, dang it, Mom, you're right. I, I haven't prayed yet. But the story that I want to tell you about my mom is uh, this one time. So we moved from Glendale when I was about 9, 10, something like that, uh, to Glendale uh, because my mom's kidneys had failed. And so we were on this waiting list uh, to get a transplant, and that was super cool. Uh, not great. Um, But I came back from teen camp this one year, and I was super pumped because they were talking about fasting. And I was like, dude, I know exactly how we're going to get this kidney in a month. We're going to fast. So I went up to my mom, and I was like, mom, we're going to fast. And she was like, okay, what are we going to fast from? And I was like, chocolate and soda. Because at the time, my main food was chocolate and my main drink was soda. So I was like, I'm going to give it up. And she was like, you're so right. We're going to give it up together. And I was like, whew, two people fasting for this? God's going to do this in two weeks. Come on. That's how it goes. We're faithful, right? But then two weeks turned into a month. And then a month into six. And then six to a year. And then a year to two years. And then two years to four years. And throughout it all, my mom and me had been tempted to eat chocolate and drink soda. I remember we had parties. Uh, One of my friend's moms makes some of the best brownies I've ever had in my entire life. And I remember they're just sitting there, and I was like, no, Satan. And I had to walk away from it. But I remember at about four and a half years of this fast, we get this call. And they're like, hey, don't get too excited, but there might be a kidney waiting for you. You guys got to start heading to the hospital now. And we're like, sick, let's go. So we get ready, we're going. And we get there, and they're getting her ready for the operating room. And they're like, the person died in transport. And the kidney's unusable. So we go home and we're defeated. And I remember thinking, I was like, dude, I'm supposed to be eating chocolate and soda with my mom right now. And I apologize if I get a little teared up on this, sorry. But then a couple months later, we get another call. And they're like, hey, don't get your hopes up. But there might be a viable kidney for you. And we go, and we're excited and everything like that. But you know that, you know, like, if you had a younger sibling, and uh, there'd be a dark hallway at night, and they would jump out and, and, and jump at you, right, and try to kind of scare you? The next time you walk through that hallway, what are you going to do? You're going to hesitate a little bit, right? 
And I'm ashamed to say that my faith hesitated. Because I love my mom. And I wanted her to have this kidney, and I didn't think that God was going to do that for her. Sorry, y'all. But I remember uh, we're getting her ready, and she has the medical gown on. She's on this plate. She's on this thing, and she's, she's ready, and they're about to take her in. And she says to me, hey, baby, open my purse when you get back to the room. Because there's something there for you. And I was like, okay, yeah, man, uh, mom, of course. And she's like, but don't take it until after. And I was like, okay, mom, yeah, I can do that for you, no worries. And in my head, I'm like, it's a will, because my mom's going to die. You know, because it's like, uh, she's going under a seizure, and I get really nervous every time. But I open up this, this purse, and inside of it is Reese's. But it's not, here's the important part, it's not just one Reese's. It's two. Because we were supposed to share it when she got out of surgery. And the thing was is that it was already in her purse before we got to the hospital. Hey, clap it up. She's awesome. Uh, it gives me a second to wipe these sweat from my eyes. Uh, uh. But she knew. She knew that that kidney was hers because God was going to give it to her. She had it already in her purse because she knew. And that stuck out to me. Never once did she waver in the belief that God was going to give her a kidney. And I imagine that's exactly how Noah's sons felt when they saw the floodwaters. The entire time thinking, bro, my dad is insane. You won't believe what he's doing in our backyard. <laughs> and then the floodwaters come and they're like, he was right. Might as well get in here now. You know, like, we're going to survive. But that's the thing, is faith should stand out. Faith should be apparent. There should be a stark difference between you and the guy next to you on the bus. Right? And in terms of how you live. Give up that seat for that old lady. Don't be rude. You can stand, hopefully. Uh, and a really intense example, again, we, we, we see this throughout the Bible. Right? And a really intense example that we can see of, this, uh, of this, this dichotomy between what we should be to other people is in 2 Corinthians 2.15. And it says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. And to the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Noah was. People don't want to rock the boat when God tells them to. But Noah built the boat. People don't want to give what they need to of themselves. Heck, we barely meet the bare minimum and we call it a blessing. But Jesus hung on that cross. Seeing faith stand out can be a breath of fresh air in the right spot. When you're in the right state of mind, you see somebody else's faith, and you're like, whoa, that's awesome. And in the other, why are they doing that? Are they just trying to get attention? Who does that? It's not for God, it's for them. You see how we can be two different people at the same time? But Noah wasn't like that. Noah was exactly that. He was in the middle. He was the key piece of evidence and judgment for the people of his time. He didn't wield the hammer of righteousness. He was the hammer of righteousness. So was Jesus. Not for just his time 2,000 somewhat years ago, but for all time. Noah is an example of how we can be like what we can be like, what we should be like, what we can achieve through faith. Amen? Amen? And so this week, I have a couple of action steps for us to take. And just ask yourself these questions throughout the week. What crazy act of faith have you put off? Have I put off? And what steps can you take to do and not try? Two, reflect throughout the week on what aroma 
you bring to others in your life? Do you bring death? Or do you bring life? And three, listen to this worship song. Monday Morning Faith by SEU Worship. That's what the picture looks like. And it's this song that talks about how I want to be more than just faithful on Sunday. That when midnight strikes on Sunday, you're not sleeping and you wake up and you're like, party. You're faithful. That it goes over to Monday. That it permeates throughout your entire life. Amen? Amen. So let our faith be crazy. But on the other hand, let our devotion be apparent. Amen. <laughs> Albert, thank you so much. That was great to hear from him, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow, thank you so much, Albert. Awesome. Um, wow, there were so many things that stood out. Um, as we, we're now going to transition, actually, into the communion. And as he was sharing, I was thinking about how that it was astounding that no one else caught on and was like, maybe Noah's into something. Maybe Noah is, could be right. Nobody else, just Noah and just his family. And, you know, the fact that people probably looked at Noah and thought he was, as, as he said, was crazy. And he must have seemed so foolish to the world around him. And as we think about the communion, I think there are many parallels to Noah's story as there are to the cross. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8, uh, verse 18, which reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. I think about that and I thought it could easily read this. The message of the flood was foolishness to those who were perishing, but it was God's power to Noah and his family who were being saved. You see, here we have one of the many parallels or a foreshadowing of Christ within the Old Testament. And you see, to the majority of the Jews and the Greeks in Corinth, this idea of Jesus not only being the Messiah, the chosen one of God, but also Jesus being God in full human form was foolishness. Because it went against the very definition of an all-powerful God. And even today, if we think about it, people look at us as if we are crazy, as if we are foolish for following Christ. You see, for the Jews and the Greeks in Corinth, if the Messiah was so powerful, then why would he allow himself to be crucified? Why would he allow himself to be captured, to be tortured, to be tried, crucified, and ridiculed? That's foolishness. But for us even today, it can seem like Christianity is so outdated, such a waste of time. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years, and however many thousands of years have gone by since Albert's sermon today on Noah. But just like Noah... What is foolishness to the world is faith to us. Because Noah trusted that the wood that he was building would save him, just as we trust that the wood that Jesus was hung on saves us now also. And so in the cross, we are called to have faith in God, just as Noah was called to have faith those thousands of years ago, trusting that what Jesus did on the cross is enough for us to be forgiven and to become a child of God. Those that have trusted, we're on the boat. We are on the ark. We're aboard. And if you're not, you're invited too. So what does God want from us now as we go to the cross in communion? He wants nothing but simply for us to enjoy the ride, enjoy the safety of being on the ark. 
choosing to continually listen to the captain, follow him as he guides us. So today, as we take communion, reflecting on Albert's great sermon, let's rejoice in the fact that just like that we have joined Noah by becoming heirs of the righteousness that comes by faith and trusting in the loving sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this message today, so grateful for how we've been able to reflect upon Noah's crazy faith, a faith that must have seemed so foolish to the people around him. But we now, God, every one of us can be Noah ourselves by having a crazy faith to trust in Jesus as he leads us home to you. We thank you, God, for his sacrifice, Lord. We thank you, God, that he was willing to be ridiculed, to be mocked, to be tortured, to be crucified for our sake so that we can be saved people. We pray, God, that his death will never be in vain and that, as Albert reminded us today, that we will be the aroma of Christ around us in a world that is perishing. But we thank you, Father, for today. We pray that we will bring you glory through our lives. But thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You've just listened to the West Side Podcast. For more information about our ministry, please visit thewestsidechurch.com or laicc.net.